I realized during the spiritual heat of the making of this episode that it's not just about searching for the truth. The key to the city is to be searching for those that don't know the truth, especially when it comes to the Bible changes. And those are the people that we need to be fighting for. If that's you today or someone you know, stay tuned. This is the Nothing Is As It Seems podcast. This is episode 11. My name is Mark. Welcome to the show. This is a special impromptu episode. And today we're going to be covering a recent live stream done by John Pounders and David Carrico, otherwise known as Now You See TV and Midnight Ride. And in this live stream Q&A, someone had the courage to press these guys on the Bible changes. But let me say up front, I don't know these guys to the same extent as some of the Bible change Mandela effect gatekeepers that I've covered in the past, like Vincent Rhodes and Dean Odell. One of the most difficult things, and I've said this before, when someone's operating in error, in this case, two people operating in error, one of the most difficult things is to make the determination whether they're doing it on purpose or they're doing it unknowingly. Let's give these guys the benefit of the doubt for now. We're going to acknowledge the red flags. We're going to acknowledge the inconsistencies. We're certainly going to acknowledge the truth, but we're going to stop short of calling them shills or controlled opposition, at least until such a time as I get more information that might demonstrate that that's what they are. So let's go right into it. As far as the Bible goes, I don't believe it's changed, and I don't believe it can because I believe that um, if we are to have a firm foundation on what is considered truth in God's word, I don't think it can change. And I he mentioned foundation, or in his words, firm foundation, and we need to stop and talk about that because that's a very important concept, and if you get the foundation wrong, the whole thing is going to be wrong. And it's a very well-known and well-established biblical concept that it's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that is to be our foundation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. He is the rock. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. His people are his stones, also called lively stones. Paul confirmed this in 1 Corinthians 3.11, stating directly that the Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation. In that same way, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is also the truth, because he said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is a very simple but very powerful and very important concept. It's the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that has the power to save. The scriptures do not save us. And I'll tell you what, I can prove it. What I'm about to show you changes everything. Second Timothy chapter three, and those that are denying the Bible changes, love verse 16. All scripture, or some would say the better translation is Every scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But the problem is that's where they tend to stop because in verse 17, we have the purpose of the scripture being defined that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. Why? Unto all good works. So let's hit verse 17 with depth here. That the man of God may be perfect. What is the that that verse 17 is referring to? And it's clearly referring to the beginning of verse 16, all scripture, or some would say the better translation, every scripture. But regardless, the that is the scripture. Next, the man of God 
may be perfect. So the scripture is given to the man of God. And it makes sense because we need the Holy Spirit to interpret, to lead us into all truth. The Bible is clear on that as well. Now, here's the key. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The scripture is given to us to help us, for to spur us into good works. And we know that no man is saved because of his good works. And the point is that our foundation is not the scripture. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the scripture does not save us. And I understand John Pounders didn't go nearly as far with this foundation issue as people like Vincent Rhodes and Dean Odell, who emphatically and very clearly, and they stated it multiple times that the foundation was the scripture. I know he's not doing that here. But I'm just pointing out that it's a common error that is being made, and I see it everywhere, that the scripture is being touted as the foundation, and it's just not true. God's powerful enough not to change it. I know he's talking off the cuff. I know it's just a short little comment, and I know we've covered it before, but it's too important to let it slide by because we're not calling into question God's power here. We're saying that God is allowing this to take place. And if you consider scripturally, this is not such a far-fetched concept because we see it throughout the Bible. There's a deep theological discussion that we could have. We could do multiple episodes. We could be here all day. But the bottom line is, I believe this type of argument has contains unbelief in it. Because it's very similar to what unbelievers will say. They'll say, well, if God were really God, he wouldn't allow babies to be killed. He wouldn't allow wars, etc. And this is a more sophisticated, more nuanced version of that argument, in my opinion. Uh, I've seen the arguments about the lion laying down with the lamb. And I know there was a popular song. I remember it when I was a kid uh, that said the lion will lay with the lamb. And I think a lot of people got that confused with what the Bible says about it personally that's just my opinion i don't know uh everything but i i can say that i do remember the proper verse and you know being a christian school or you know my whole life i had to memorize lots of scripture and some of the scriptures that people say have changed they haven't changed since i was a little boy i'm 41 years old so i don't know when they have expected it to happen but if it's small stuff like they're saying has happened then we can't trust any of it actually Uh, in my opinion. So that's where I'm at on that. And I'm not trying to be mean to anybody or anything. That's not my goal. My goal is just to tell you, I don't believe that it happened or I would say that I believed it. I don't believe that it would have to had us happen. So I'm not going to say something that I don't believe, I guess is the best way to put it. In episode nine, I'd recommend you check it out. I covered Hugo talks and his video calling the Bible changes a hoax. And the interesting thing about that video was Hugo was willing to acknowledge the residual evidence, at least some of it. And in this clip, John Pounders references a song about the lion and the lamb. And I think from a big picture metagame sense, whether these guys know they're doing it or not, the residual evidence is too substantial. There's too much of it to completely deny it. It has to be acknowledged. So that's a good thing. As far as the rest of it, to me, it's a marginalization argument and a downplaying argument because this is not just about the lion and the lamb and little things, as he says in this clip. And one of the big problems of that I've had with, with most of the people that are denying the Bible changes is that they cherry pick the scriptures and for the most part, not all of them, they avoid discussing the scriptures that seem to be contrary to the very character of God, like nursing fathers or all the stuff about breastfeeding, gird about the paps with a golden girdle. We've covered these in past videos. David, what do you got? You've been studying the Bible longer than I've been alive, probably. I don't, I, you know, how many years now, David? Oh my, way over 40. Over 40. So as longer than I've been alive, you've been studying it. So if anybody would know if the Bible has been changed, you should know, considering you studied probably the same translation for the last 40 years. I I, I just, uh, you know, I, I have to go back to that because 
Yeah, my memory is pretty good. I do have a photographic memory, not as good as some people's photographic memory, but I don't remember these changes that people are saying for sure happen. So there you go. Hmm. This to me is the first thing that I've seen that I would say is a red flag. Let's listen to that clip one more time. David, what do you got? You've been studying the Bible longer than I've been alive, probably. I don't, I, you know, how many years now, David? Oh my, way over 40. Over 40. So as longer than I've been alive, you've been studying it. So if anybody would know if the Bible has been changed, you should know, considering you studied probably the same translation for the last 40 years. I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I have to go back to that because, yeah, my memory is pretty good. I do have a photographic memory, not as good as some people's photographic memory, but I don't remember these changes that people are saying for sure happen. So there you go. If anybody would know if the Bible is being changed, it would be David Carrico, who's been studying it for over 40 years. And by the way, I have a photographic memory. And I want you to think about the implications of those statements. Because what this is, is it's a very simple argument to authority. We have the authority because we have the, the amount of time studying this. I've got the photographic memory. And really what he's saying is, don't listen to yourself. You need to listen to us. As far as the Mandela effect, that's a total fraud. That Mandela effect, that's a total fraud and a total lie. Um, the Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's settled. It's uh, inviolate and it's preserved. God said he will not only give us his word, but he will preserve it. We have not only an inspired word, but we have a preserved word. First thing I want to point out here is the pattern or format by which they're doing their Q&A session. And maybe they're not doing it on purpose, but it's very similar to the pattern by which Vincent Rhodes and Dean Odell did their live stream on the Mandela effect and the Bible changes. Check out episodes two and four. I cover Vincent Rhodes and Dean Odell. There's going to be more parts to that. Check out episode one for the big picture of what I believe is going on with the denial of the Bible changes. But what I see here is a good cop, bad cop that was employed by Vincent Rhodes and Dean Odell. Vincent Rhodes was the good cop. Dean Odell comes in after the fact. He's the heavy. He's the bad cop. In this situation, John Pounders appears to be the good cop. David Carrico, he's the heavy. He's the bad cop. And again, I'm not saying they're doing, doing it on purpose, but the pattern is certainly eerily reminiscent of Rhodes and Odell. Now on to Carrico's comments in this clip. He makes an emphatic statement that Mandela effect is a total fraud and a total lie. And he quotes Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And of course, he references multiple times his belief that God's word or what he really means, God's scripture is preserved on the words of the page. When you hear someone talking like that, when they repeatedly use the phrase preserved word, in my experience, it usually indicates a doctrinal error, which stems from a false balance overemphasis on the importance of scripture in our Christian walk and a misunderstanding of Psalm 12. I covered this in pretty good detail in episode 10. I'd recommend you check it out. But for this clip, he references Psalm 119, verse 89, as his proof text that the Mandela effect or Bible changes are a total fraud and a total hoax. So let's hit that right now. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy debar, which is the Hebrew word, is settled in heaven. What does that Hebrew word debar mean? And if you study the Hebrew, it's a very broad word. It's a very interesting word. It can mean God's purposes, God's plans, God's promises, God's cause, among many other things. But the point is, it's a very broad word. And it's a mistake to take something that broad and to try to shrink it down into something very specific, like the scriptural words on a page. And if you read Psalm 119 in context, 
And unfortunately, it's a very long psalm, so we don't have time to cover it. But if you read it, you'll see that that word debar in the Hebrew is not, absolutely not referring to the scripture. Furthermore, God's debar is forever settled where? On the words of a page? No, it defines it right in the verse. And it's very clear, very simple, and very straightforward. God's debar is forever settled in heaven. It does not say God's debar is forever settled on the words of a page on earth. Uh, the, the original King James had the Apocrypha in it. The Apocrypha was separated for the reason that the fear that the average person could not sort it out. And this is probably true and right because the the apocryphal books, just like the Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, they all have to be read in light of the canon, which is supreme. And this was always uh, agreed upon among all the King James translators. So there, the original King James Bible, I have the copy of the very first edition. It's in the Old English font. It's hard to read. That has changed. The English font has been updated. As far as the actual words, if you have a um, a Cambridge edition, you're you're getting the absolute final uh, preserved edition as it was finally there. There were some typos in the first edition. Some typos in the font. The actual text has not changed at all. And the actual words that were given. Now, there is there is a final, uh, uh, when this was being done, the two great scholarly schools in England were Cambridge and Oxford. There's a Cambridge edition, and there's an Oxford edition of the King James. And there's minor differences, just very little. I'll show you one. Uh, in the Oxford edition, and th those that have a Schofield Bible have an Oxford edition. And if you have a Schofield Bible, which I detest, <laughs> but if you will look, but it's the Oxford edition, which isn't bad. There are very few differences. But in the Oxford edition, uh, in Genesis chapter one and verse two, uh, the spirit of God will be capitalized, capital S. And in the Cambridge, it's not. And here I thought, well, OK, but anyway, just very minor differences like the capitalization of a letter or something like that. I have a question. What does any of this have to do with the Bible changes? How does any of it demonstrate that the Mandela effect and the Bible changes are a total fraud and a lie, like he said? This isn't a scholarly exercise where the people that are the most well-read and have the best educations get the answer right, and everybody else has to look to them for that. That's not how this works. According to the Bible, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. They're not scholarly discerned. There are word differences to some of them because I have both a Schofield and a Cambridge, and when me and my boys were doing Bible studies, we noticed a few in genesis just small differences yeah and and like that's i think that's part of the reason why there were so many pushes to translate the bible into so many different kind of things because it's really hard to decipher like did i read that in the niv did i read that in the esv did i read that in the king james 1611 did i read it into the updated version or the updated version of that you know and, and i the cambridge version like you said um is the original correct this is a red flag. I've covered this before. This was originally reported by Scott Johnson of contendingfortruth.com, a recommended ministry. In 2012, the BMA, short for Baptist Missionary Association, held a conference in Missouri, invited the Baptist churches and the leaders into a private room and told them that the members of their churches were going to start approaching leadership about Bible changes. They were told that if the general membership accepted the Bible changes or were aware of them, they would start leaving the churches. And therefore, they were to blame the Bible changes on translation misunderstandings. So that's the company line, regardless of whether he knows he's doing it or not. Now, also, there's the sword Bible, which is the King James Bible, but it takes upon itself to make changes. So uh, there's all kinds of editions of the King James Bible that aren't 
uh, just the solid pure KJV because people, the, the King James Bible is public domain. And we could take the King James Bible and put out a Now You See TV Bible, which okay. wouldn't be a bad idea with the Book of Enoch and the Apocrypha in it. But you also can do that and make changes, which we would not do. So a lot of people, and you know what I say, don't mess with my Bible. David Beverly, whose channel is Jesus Freak Computer Geek, covered this. And by the way, he's a recommended Christian brother. His channel is recommended. I hope to have him on the show at some point. He did a really nice job bringing this into the light that they're saying that the Bible can't change. Yet in this clip, they're going over all the different ways that it apparently has changed. So there's a contradiction there. And I would recommend checking out David's video. I'll put a link in the description. And, and the guy in there saying we're either stupid or lying. Now, I just want to say this. like If the Mandela effect is a real thing, it allows for the idea of a multiverse. And so if that's true, me and David would be from another one of the other timelines. And so we're telling the truth. Maybe you're from the different timeline and you're coming over here trying to tell us this. You know, So like you got to think of it that way, too. Maybe you're the one that's from a different timeline where all of this changed. And, and I don't believe that that's possible, but I'm just saying like, if, if the Mandela effects legitimate, there are going to be people that believe one way and there's going to be people that believe the other because they're from two different intersecting multiverses that have clashed together somehow. So we're not lying. I, I can yeah. say that. And, yeah. and I don't think that we're stupid. So maybe we are, maybe, maybe I'm stupid and don't know it, but at least I'm happy. Right. So yeah. there we go. If the Mandela effect is a real thing, it allows for the idea of a multiverse. Well, that's not a true statement in its absolute sense. Some have said that for sure. Others have other ideas. Some have said that the secular changes are different from the Bible changes. So what we really have here is a sophisticated form of a straw man argument mixed with a red herring argument because you're still not going anywhere near the elephant in the room, which are the Bible changes that seem to be contrary to the character of God, nursing fathers, breastfeeding men, gender strifes, etc., etc. We still haven't gone anywhere near those. I think the <laughs> devil might be the liar behind this Mandela effect. Yeah. And I prayed not long ago. There was a lady and she was up in years, bless her heart. And she had a question about this Mandela effect. And, and I talked with her about it and I said, ma'am, if I believe that I could lay my Bible down on my table and wake up the next morning and, you know, whether it's time traveling, devil's ale, whoever's doing it, the, I can't get a straight answer out of them on that. But whoever's changing our Bible, but I could get up and tomorrow morning, my Bible be all different. I wouldn't care about reading it. <laughs> and this lady said, well, I've quit reading my Bible. I've quit reading it because I'm afraid that it'll just change like that. And I prayed with her and we rebuked that devil and that woman was set free in the name of Jesus. And she's enjoying the word of God again. You see how important this is? Because these two gentlemen, they haven't made a cogent argument. They're, they're obviously not in a position where they should be advising others what to do when it comes to this subject. They haven't even addressed the important stuff. And yet they're leading people down a road. And I'm not talking about the fact that this woman may be reading the Bible. I'm talking about the fact of what she believes to be true about the Bible changes. And there are others out there like the woman that out of his own mouth, he at least, so he says, tried to minister to. And those are the people in the valley of decision that it's so important that we reach. And what about you? Where are you at with this? If you see this, are you willing to go out on a limb? Are you willing to look bad in front of your family and friends? Are you willing to share this with someone who may be in that valley of decision, maybe doesn't know better? Are you willing to stand up for the truth, even if it costs you something? Because the truth is, it's going to cost you something. This concludes episode 11. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, share. I welcome all of your feedback, even negative feedback. This was a special episode. Next week, we have... An episode that's been delayed for a little while, but I think it's going to be worth it. 
We have former rap star Lef joining me for an interview. He came out of that life. He walked off the stage. It's a very interesting story. Really looking forward to it. We will see you next week.